couple minutes ago, and it was a, a reason to so kind of clarify, I, I had mentioned earlier that there were, and I think I misspoke, in the United States, before honeybees arrived, there were bees, and there are actually quite a diverse number of native bees, members of the, uh, kind of the, the broader Avisuit, the, um, the mason bees, the bumblebees, I mean, those are native to the U.S., and they were here long before honeybees came, so I apologize if, if I was a bit fun. Let's confuse that. And so some beekeepers, for example, or again, some people like the idea of encouraging pollinators in their gardens, but don't really want to invest in them the time and the money, and we're going to get into now the equipment of keeping honeybees. And so they end up keeping mason bees or building mason bee houses or bumblebee houses, and that's just as good. That's great. Those are so much fun to watch kind of come and go. Um, but again, you're not really keeping them, you're sort of just creating a, a nice place for them to live, and that becomes their home. So there, there are native bees to the United States. Again, um, yeah, sorry about that. One of the things that, that I want to very quickly get into now is equipment. Um, and Dennis just mentioned, one of, the, one of the programs that will be part of our Wednesday hands-on classes is to install new packages of honeybees. So the class will be kind of broken up into groups. Um, on Wednesday, and each group will then get packages of honeybees to work with. So if, again, if you're part of this class and you're thinking to yourself, geez, you know, I, I really want to kind of work with honeybees for a year before I make the financial investment, this is your opportunity because you'll have your own little package and you'll just be working in our AP area and there'll be our bees and, and those kind of things. And so if you kill them then, whatever. <laughs> nice. <laughs> your tuition dollars pay for um, So the idea right, is that it will give you an opportunity to, to, to really work with them before you make, again, that financial investment and you put them in your own house. Because again, starting a hive of honeybees, a couple slides later I'll give you some more numbers, but um, it, it, it's not cheap, and I think that's the unfortunate part. Um, by the time you have bought your, your, your packages of bees and all of your equipment, you can be close to six, seven hundred dollars, which is not a question. Again, so with this program, what we at least are offering is through the Wednesday class is a chance for you to work with these hands-on experience all the way through, including the honey extraction and then uh, take some bottles of honey home in the fall um, as, as part of this. So, yes. We also have a few bee suits that they could, they wouldn't have to buy, they could use. Yeah. This will be in a couple of weeks, no, yes. this next week. We'll right. talk about that, but just put that in the back of your mind as you're, as you're sort of thinking about this next lecture is the amount of equipment that's involved and then again, the sort of the, the finances. Now, to kind of help you along, what, we're, what we have for you are catalogs from equipment manufacturers. These are the 2015 catalogs and they're being spread out outside. So after, on, after we finish up on your way home, grab one of all of these thumb through them, they're really educational, fantastic. The ones that we're giving you are companies that have been around a long time. They, some of their, their operations date into the 1800s. I mean, these are long-term companies that have invested a lot of research dollars and they make really nice equipment. And so um, those are the ones that we're gonna hand you. And again, they're just outside on the table, grab one of each. You know, when you start thumbing through them, What's, what's kind of fun is that they're just as educational as they are to try to sell you something. Because again, these are beekeeping families and generations of beekeepers that make this stuff. So if you have a question and you're stuck, and you will just pick up the phone, there's a real good chance the person on the other end was in their AP area that morning. You're going to talk to people that, that know this. So it's kind of a, it's a niche market, but at the same time, you'll, you'll hopefully find a, a really good experience. So, um, catalogs will be on the, on the counter, and if you have questions about what we talk about today and then uh, what you see in the catalogs, bring them next week. You can ask them on Wednesday, Sarah should know the answers, and if not, um, certainly should email me or we can talk about it next time. But your homework is to kind of go through these catalogs and just sort of get a sense of the, the cost and you know, pick some things out. Because now truly is the time of year, if you're going to start your hive of honeybees this year, Now's the time to be ordering your, your equipment. It's, it's really now. Um, we'll talk about how to set it up and how to build it and stuff in this lecture. But now's the time of year to, to order your equipment. It's also the time of year to order your package of honeybees. On Wednesday, I'll give you a list, or Sarah will give you a list of all of the package producers in the United States that can import these into Wisconsin. Some, some can and can't, but for the most part, most of them can. 
so that we can start calling around to get prices again for these and uh, their availability. But let's get into tools. Because I think, you know, it's a fairly um, simple hobby, I guess, more or less, to have. Um, your number one tools, uh, not, not to joke too much, but really are your ears and eyes. These insects are not domesticated. What you're trying to do is to create a favorable environment for them to live in so that they're happy. That's all we can do. I would recommend that you keep a notebook when you are starting to work with your bees. I'll give you some example worksheets that I've used in, the, in years past to keep track of, of the types of things to look for and the types of information to report. But keep a notebook. Um, I think it's a great idea. And pencils are great. There are some apps nowadays that you can keep on your smartphone that you can put a little QR code on the side of your hive and scan it and answer very similar questions. So if you don't want to use pencils, you can use your iPhone in your VR. So equipment breaks down into three main groups. And that's largely how you're going to see these catalogs organized are into what I've referred to as body protection. The second group are hive tools, and there's the tools that you use to kind of manipulate the hive. And then the last group is hive parts. And I really would like to spend maybe even the rest of today on this, just so that you have a very clear understanding about the types of equipment that are used in bees, or used, used in beekeeping. The, the first group, kind of getting into that body protection, that personal protective equipment, the first sort of main group is really your face protection. Dating back even to, to the 1800s, veils were often used to cover your face. You do not want to get stung on your face. Your face tissue is very soft. One of my students, years and years ago, we were broadcasting live in our apiary, and it was on Fox 6 News, and she got stung in the face. That was just terrible. I swelled up for weeks. Remember? You remember Terry? Oh, yeah, I swelled up. <laughs> <laughs> um, you don't want to get stung in the face. So there are different types of face protection. But the, the truly most historic one is the one on the left. It's just a veil that's been stretched over kind of a pith helmet, and that's the helmet and veil. Now, some of the later ones are um, veils that have a little more structure to them, little wiring boxes to keep the veil off your face. But I used the one on the left for years, and it was truly my favorite until someone broke into our apiary and stole it. It made me really mad, because I liked this one. It was just great. Um, but nonetheless, helmet and veil is at the absolute minimum if you're going to keep these. Please get this. Helmets and veils. And one of the things that we're going to do on Wednesday is we're going to have a, a variety of collection of this kind of material for you to try on. See what you like. See what size fits you. Uh, those kind of things. So we have a kind of a collection of things here that we've kind of gotten over the years. So we're going to make sure, again, on Wednesday, you'll have the chance to try these kind of things on. Now, the suits and jackets are something that have become extraordinarily popular over the last, say, 15 years or so. The jackets and suits have the veil that's kind of stitched into a kind of a larger suit. Now, the suit itself is made out of fairly heavy cotton. It's not, it's not entirely sting-proof. I mean, the stinger can still go through it, but it certainly is much better than you know, kind of a thin shirt. Um, but if you put a, a set of clothes on and you put that over your, your body, those, those, those suits really do keep the bees out. And if you do get stung, it's really more of just a Quite scratched in a true penetration. These jackets, largely, I think, in my opinion, at least the people I've met, they came out of Africanized beekeeping. So think Central and, and Latin America, where they're keeping these kind of honeybees for honey production, uh, the Africanized strains. They really have to make sure they don't get stung. I mean, that is just the most paramount thing. Because if they get stung, that could be really, really bad. And so I'm my understanding is that's where the suits and the jackets largely originated from, and then they kind of made their way to the U.S. and um, certainly have become extraordinarily popular with kind of backyard beekeepers, the, the urban beekeepers. Number one reason is because there's virtually no way for a honeybee to get into that suit. You are completely encased in fabric, and so you're, um, you're going to be a very comfortable beekeeper. There are a couple of suits that are out there nowadays that are a little more novel. They breathe a little bit differently. The cost all rolls into it. For the most part, the ones that are made out of 100% cotton tend to be really quite nice, I mean, regardless of the manufacturer. I've used one for quite some time now, and it's, it's really quite comfortable. 
but not all <coughs> students are white. So I'm showing you a picture on the left of, of someone that found a bee suit that was made out of some really wacky colors. Mm -hmm. This is a company called Sheriff, and they make suits of a variety of different kind of colors. Now, the classic thought, and, and again, this is, I think, more anthropomorphic than anything, is that the white color is so that the bees don't see, which is not the right answer. A lot, of, a lot of people thought, well, you know, honeybees in the wild are constantly being agitated by bears and by animals that have dark colored fur. And so let's make a bee suit, and let's make it out of white so that you don't look like a bear. Well, I'll be honest with you, the bees don't see the bear. The bees see the, the thing that's taking their hive apart, to be honest with you. The color doesn't matter. The color that makes you happy. Um, I kind of like the red one, the orange one. Is. <laughs> now, there are a couple of manufacturers that make kid size bee suits. When I, years ago, I used to have my my youngest Jacob would wear an adult size suit, and I'd pull the arms down, and I would tie the arms in a knot, and it was like half of his size. I mean, his knees were like falling out of this thing. And so we're lucky now that there are suits that are made especially for kids. They're proportional. Um, so if you have children and you want to involve them in keeping these, that's certainly something that, that you can do now because they make things for kids. This is not a bee suit. Yes, sir, just really quick. I've read in a couple of places where it says bees don't like dark colors. So are you saying that's really not true? You know, it's not known. It's not proven. Anyway. Go all the way back to about the fourth slide that I showed you, right? Bees don't see color. Okay. They see ultraviolet. And so if you take your bright white clothes and you put them into your laundry detergent that has ultraviolet light, sort of bring out the brights and the whites kind of scenario, you're going to shine. So, but Chris, that's a great question. I think it's a, kind of an interesting misconception. They see in the ultraviolet spectrum, not so much in the visible light spectrum. Um, but, um, back to the point. If, if you like, you know, in these colors and it works for you, go for it. Um, Kids, these are all the wrong kind of bee suits. Just make you laugh. <laughs> these are the wrong kind of suits. These have no protection over honeybee. The the, um, the suit and the intention of that face protection. I'll go back to the most critical point, and I've worked with a lot of beginning beekeepers over the years. <clears throat> the biggest, I think, hurdle that, that beginning beekeepers often have to come over is that instinctual fear of being stung. Honestly. And so to get over that sort of fear, these kind of full body bee suits put you in, I think, a very calm state of mind. And I think it really helps that beginning beekeeper make that sort of first step into the apiary. Because when you put this suit on and you zip the top across the top, you are truly encapsulated. There is no way for bees to get in there. And I think just mentally and psychologically that prepares you then for walking out into that apiary. They're not very expensive and and it really has put you in a calm state of mind. And if you're calm, you're more likely to move uh, smoother and slower. And I've seen this time and time again. I can't tell you the number of times where I've had students that, you know, get nervous in there. They sort of touch something and then they're just shaking because they're just anxious about that getting stumped, right? And so if they walk out into the apiary, they're dressed like this, they're much more calm. And go or not. The second group is uh, our personal protective equipment is hand protection. And so left hand side it shows a pair of, of bee gloves. Now these bee gloves were made years ago. And the design hasn't really changed much. It's a full leather hand and a long gauntlet. And these were initially designed to be worn um, over over like a coat maybe or over even like a shirt like this. So it, it, it gave you the wearer protection up to kind of just above his elbow. Well, that doesn't really work very well with these suits. I mean, you kind of see this poor guy's got these, these gloves pulled all the way up to his, his elbow and it's all bunched up. But that's about the best we still have. No one's really redesigned the bee glove. Now, the picture I'm showing you in the bottom left-hand corner is a pair of work gloves. The answer is no way. Do not wear these in the bee yard. The reason why is that the cloth on the very top of your knuckles is an awful thin. And the bee stinger will go straight through that. And it, it, it just won't work. Um, a couple of other gloves I've seen through the years, the welder's gloves. If you get thin, thinner welder's gloves, they work pretty good. What you're looking for is all leather. And it doesn't have to be like really like 
bull hide kind of thickness, but something like kangaroo could work, um, deer skin could work, but look in your beekeeping supply company, the, the catalogs themselves uh, have a great selection of gloves. Um, things like nitrile gloves or your dishwasher gloves that you have at home, don't wear those. That's absolutely no protection. Um, the bees will sting right through that. And so, um, again, don't wear those kind of work gloves. Lean more to the gloves that you'll find in the beekeeping uh, company uh, supply catalogs. The, the leather's thick enough and, and they've, been, they've been tested. The one correction that, I'll, that, I, that I would mention about this is I would pull the, I'll pull the gloves actually underneath the sleeves of this suit and we'll practice putting these suits on and taking them off. That's again, all part of that Wednesday idea. So um, you'll have lots of opportunity to get dressed and undressed. Well, with the clothes on. <laughs> and yeah, we'll just there. Yeah. So the other protection. Now, if you are, if you decide against a full-length suit, because one of the things you can buy is a jacket, which is about half a suit. It just kind of stops here. It's not completely full-length. Is to get a nice pair of, of like farm gray cowboy blue jeans, not like jeans from Coles, bless their hearts that have kind of the thinner denim, you're looking for farm grade, like tractor grade denim. It's almost sting proof. That's a really tight weave, all cotton denim. Um, wear those, uh, it's a nice pair of jeans, some nice boots, long socks, and a shirt like this is perfectly fine if you're just wearing uh, a veil or if you were wearing a jacket. Now, if you have a full length suit and you put on a thick pair of blue jeans, it can get kind of hot. So if you're wearing a suit, you can get away with thinner, underclothes, but if you're not wearing a full-length suit, I definitely recommend um, a really nice quality pair of, of, of heavy denim blue jeans. At the bottom right-hand corner, if everyone can see this, the bottom right-hand corner um, kind of shows an individual who has uh, pulled his socks up over his blue jeans, and I have lots of stories of, uh, and I'll tell you one of my own, where I kind of dressed almost exactly like this after church one Sunday. I decided to stop at the bee yard, and I was just doing something real quick, and I, and I just, you know, kind of did this and closed the box up. What I didn't realize is that even in doing that, a honeybee had fallen on my shoe and was climbing up the inside of my pant leg. Okay, so I'm on I-94 at 70 miles an hour, and I feel it crawling up the inside of my leg. I mean, he's like there. And I'm like, okay, what do I do? 70 miles an hour down the interstate. Do I let it keep going, or do I just kind of take it and smack it where it's at, right? Whenever you walk into your APR, what did you do? <laughs> <laughs> Whenever you walk into your APR, <laughs> make sure that you pull your socks up over the bottom of your pant legs. Because that'll keep those little stranglers that, that will, uh, inevitably they will. They'll be walking around the ground, and if they find your foot, they may want to kind of crawl up your foot. Um, lesson learned. Her boots are great because if, if they're going to underline anything, <coughs> underline that. Yes. That is, and it's the, you're not the only person. Yeah. No, it said. Right. Because as you're manipulating your frames and you're moving things around, inevitably bees will be flying everywhere and they'll fall on the ground and they will want to crawl up. Um, the other thing is if you are buying a pair, if you're buying jeans and you're wearing a, um, a jacket, Make sure that you stuff your jacket down into your jeans, so maybe get that waist a little bit larger than you normally would for like a, a nice fit, and then put a belt on. Another life story. So I'm out working in the apiary, and I kind of forgot that, and I'm working, and I look up, and there's a bee inside my veil right here. And I've got bees just everywhere. We're, we're working, and we're working, and the way she got in is I bent over, and it kind of came untucked, and she found a little spot, and it somehow climbed all the way up my back, and was right there. <laughs> lesson learned. So that one I was able to kind of just grab, but at the same time, you know, all she would have had to do is walk across, because there's nothing more scary than to have one walk across your forehead. Mm -hmm. It'll happen, hopefully not to you, <laughs> to your next door neighbor there. Um, so with jeans, maybe buy them just a, a slightly bit uh, larger so that if, you, again, you're wearing a jacket, you can tuck it in. Some final notes, the, the perfumes and colognes, uh, please don't wear those. Um, practice good hygiene. Don't bicycle, for example, out to your apiary and then get out and then expect to work your honeybees. I and mean, you're producing a lot of mammal pheromone as you're sweating and as you're working. Um, so, you know, don't, don't go stinking out there. 
avoid those kind of strong foods, the, the things like um, onions and garlic. And, you know, don't go out for Italian right before you go to your eight year, because again, that's going to be coming out of your, of your, of your mouth. Um, including bananas, and bananas have a long time kind of been laughing back and forth in beekeeping, but the, um, the banana releases a, a smell that's similar to the alarm pheromone in honeybees, and I've done this just to kind of proof test this a concept. And if you're breathing and you're sort of sending out this artificial alarm pheromone and unintentionally, you could really get the bees mad quickly. The last point, and the last two points actually are really quite great, and they roll hand in hand to each other. So the personal protective equipment that you'll see here, you'll get a chance to try it on Wednesday. It's used to protect you. That's it. You're going to squish bees, and that's all right. And I think if you're protected and it'll boost your level of comfort and confidence, you're going to be a much better beekeeper, hands down, all around. I've seen this for the last many, many years of, of doing this. Um, invest in, in, in good beekeeping you and you're in good shape. Hive tools. Hive tools are very simple. These are the same tools that if if Reverend Langstroth was to walk in this in this it's room, he would recognize all of this. And these tools have not really changed much in the last hundred plus years. The first one is a smoker. Now smokers are used to generate smoke. They can get extraordinarily hot. Now this is a big one. And this is used for when we're doing a lot of work over a long time in the apiary, we'll oftentimes light up the big smoker. Most smokers are much smaller than this, and if you're keeping one or two hives of bees, you can use one that's probably half of this size. And that's again one of the things on Wednesday, you're going to practice. How do you light this thing? How do you open hives up? How do you sort of make this thing work? Um, do a lot of that together. And especially if you buy your own equipment, please bring some of it with you so that we can make sure that you know how to put it on correctly, how to light your smoker. That's again really what we're driving on this Wednesday license. Um, so a smoker's job is to just generate smoke. Um, you'll build a small fire in the bottom of this and you're going to restrict the amount of oxygen flow by putting the lid back on. And you squeeze the bellows, which put a, a small stream of air, which forces it through the fire and then out the top. It works just like a little chimney smoker. The uh, fuel that you use in your smoker is kind of multiple types of, of combustible materials. I really like that cedar pet bedding that you can get in like the huge block. It's cheap, um, comp, um, large chip mulch works really well. Pine straw, not so much because it burns really hot and it burns really fast. If you have a source of raw cotton, that works great. If you're traveling through the south and you know somebody that grows cotton, we've grown it a little bit in our department here um, with, with mixed success. And there's also pellet fuel. And again, a lot of this kind of fuel, you can see them in these catalogs, but the cedar bed bed, you can buy it in a large home depot or wherever and get a huge chunk of it, and it'll last you many years. The other have tools. Oh, you know what? That's right. This thing turns itself off every so often. Force break. No. <laughs> yeah. Did this to me last year, too. Every so often, talk amongst yourselves. Talk to you. <laughs> <laughs> It'll be just a minute. I tell you what. Why don't you take? We'll take a quick five-minute break. Come right back. We'll get back into this. But I don't want you to wait. Can they grab the catalogs now? Yeah, go ahead and grab the catalogs. Yeah, sure. Yeah. They're out there grab. Right. Good thing, then. <laughs> You're going to grab my phone? Yeah. I don't know why it does that. That could be. No, that's Ryan. He's here. I think. Yeah. I could look for him. You want to talk to him? Okay, let me see if he's still here. On Friday, Harrison was like three minutes and then he jumped back and it was fine.
Thank you. 